Welcome to a conversation. Today I have Alex Bormissa. Bormissa. Bormissa, yes. Uh, I've worked with, uh, you know, Night Perk before. Um, I know last semester you worked on tuition. Um, mm -hmm. And tell me about, you know, past programs you worked on before. Well, um, we have been pushing very, very heavily on higher education um, this last year particularly mm -hmm. um, and fighting SUNY 2020. Um, so SUNY 2020 was this plan that was put into place back in 2010 to deal with the um, you know, economic downturn of a couple years beforehand because they had to make cuts to higher education. And when the deal was passed, it, w it was stated that students are going to pay um, more money each year for higher education, $300 more a year, and it was given the you know, guise of being called uh, rational tuition increases, but of course, people would say that increasing tuition $1,500 over the course of five years as a plan to do doesn't make it rational just because people know they're coming. It just means that they have more anxiety when they realize they won't be able to pay for it or they'll have to take on more debt than they would have had to otherwise. Um, and so, like I said, it got passed in 2010 and mm -hmm. this year it's going to expire. And the talks had been to, uh, the talks have been, what are we going to do uh, about this? Are we going to extend it? Are we going to uh, stop it? And so the governor wants to extend SUNY 2020, he wants to extend the so-called rational tuition increase of $300 a year for the next five years. Um, and we're saying no, that needs to stop. And actually some really good news on that front because of all the student momentum on this issue, um, reaching out to their legislative officials, um, doing press conferences across the state, petitioning, doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, both the Senate and Assembly in New York State, both of them have caused for freezing tuition instead of increasing it each year for another five years. In our view, it's not that, it's not that tuition even needs to increase. Mm -hmm. It's that the state, um, and particularly the governor, but I'm sure there are also other players as well, um, they just need to invest more in higher education. They have cut higher education by $1.7 billion since 2008. And they're trying to make up for that. Their lack of, their lack of funding, they're putting it onto the backs of students who already have so much going on, who already can't afford it, who uh, now graduate on average with almost $30,000 in debt and that's before any interest even begins to take place. Mm -hmm. So to continue increasing tuition when in reality New York State, who by the way, apparently has a billion dollar surplus right now, mm -hmm. um, to push that burden onto students and not take some of the, uh, not take some of the initiative themselves mm -hmm. to fix it, I think that just shows that they don't care about the issues of students. Mm -hmm. Of course, now the Senate and the Assembly, on the other hand, they're starting to see the mm -hmm. error in their ways mm -hmm. and they're starting to take action on it as well. You know, it's proven that, you know, if you have an education, your social, you know, economic standing increases, your, your chance of social mobility increases. Um, and especially in a place like Binghamton um, itself, right. which has a lot of economic problems, you need education more, more than ever. Um, and I'm sure you work with students, um, and you actually work with local communities. Um, uh, you work with local initiatives, I believe? Yes, um, so we are primarily a student organization, but we do like to do a lot of work in the community and really just on a statewide level in general. Um, we do a ton of work um, environmentally throughout all of New York, but uh, to be more specific on localities in the Binghamton area, we actually just over this weekend um, dropped off over a thousand paper bags to houses in the neighborhood of Johnson City. because We're looking for, um, you know, obviously um, non-perishable goods, but also things like hygiene products and particularly feminine hygiene products that a lot of people just don't really think about when they're donating. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, get as much of that as possible. We'll be uh, filling up the Binghamton University Food Pantry and giving everything that is left to Chow. Um, we're really looking to get a lot of diversity in the donations that we're giving and also sort of spreading awareness that yes, obviously people who are homeless, people who are in poverty, they need to eat and we should provide them and help them out. Mm -hmm. But they also, um, they might also need soap. They might also need shampoo or toothbrushes and toothpaste. Mm -hmm. um, all these things that, you know, 
help us get by in society. I mean, I couldn't imagine going two days without brushing my teeth. Yeah, and definitely. I definitely. wonder, you know, I, I would love to help out people like that any way I can. Now, in, in your experience, especially you're working with, you know, students in education and even working with these local communities, do you find that there is that there's a cycle, that there is a, a bigger system that really um, prevents people from, you know, getting out of the situation, you know? Is there any trends you've seen or any, um, in talking to people, anything that they've said in particular that's, you know, caught your attention? Well, there are a lot of things that a lot of different people say. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, higher education really has an impact on what you're able to do to increase your economic and social or standing. Uh, standing, thank yeah, you. No problem. And I think that would really have a lot to do with it. I mean, we're at a day and age, we're at a point in our society where a college degree is what a high school degree was worth, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, both my parents never went to college. They didn't have to, they didn't want to, and they certainly didn't need to. Um, but that's not the case anymore. And the more we allow people to be able to go to school um, by keeping tuition affordable, um, over the last five years we have seen people in lower income, people in lower incomes, particularly in CUNY, not going into college simply because they know they can't afford it. Um, and they might not be able to get the financial aid they need, but also to increase financial aid as well, making sure that people who cannot afford it year after year have access to it. And not even just undergraduates too, graduate students who used to have, uh, who used to have access to TAP, the tuition assistance program, um, who no longer have it. And also providing it to undocumented citizens as well. Um, in many cases, these are students who went from kindergarten through 12th grade in a public school because New York began to offer it to undocumented citizens. Um, but then they sort of hit this brick wall once they graduate. Mm -hmm. And they're no longer allowed, or they're, they're not allowed to take out financial aid. So they have to pay for college completely out of their pockets if they want to attend college. And it leaves a lot of undocumented citizens without a higher education. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's, it's the same way for all people, whether they're documented or undocumented. The better the access is to higher education, the better chance they have of bringing up their economic okay. and social standings. All right, yeah, that's interesting. I know um, Binghamton um, is a very diverse school in the sense that we have a lot of international students, you know, people straight from Turkey, China, Absolutely. India. Um, and one of the big um, concerns local students have is that, um, is that minorities and people who are more susceptible to poverty are not that well represented and don't get enough resources. Um, do you think that there's something Binghamton could do to improve um, more diversity and just to help, again, you know, undocumented citizens, um, people who, you know, for whatever reason are not able to get a visa? Um, is there any um, programs or any suggestions you have for improving that? Well, I mean, uh, not just at Binghamton in general, uh, but, but in general, rather. Mm -hmm. um, increasing financial aid would be a huge help for that. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that people in lower income, possibly minority communities, they have a better chance of getting into a college. They have less to worry about in terms of having to pay back a massive student loan debt, which is really just, you know, how can you even imagine that? I'm currently, probably shouldn't be saying this for the cameras, I'm currently mm -hmm. in about $30,000 of student debt. Now, I mean, I grew up lower middle class, um, and that is a huge, <laughs> of money. Um, I can't imagine what it must look like for for really anybody who just, I mean, I've certainly never seen $30,000 before. Mm. Can't even imagine what it looks like. Um, mm. So I, I really think increasing financial aid um, to people who need it most is a big step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, there are things that the students could work together with, um, with the campus, um, as far as possibly doing letter writing campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it's something that NYPIRG doesn't really work on in general, but we do teach students um, how to become leaders in their communities, how to take action on the things that we care about. That's part of our dual mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, creating the next leaders of this country, of this state particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
teaching them how they could possibly do that. So maybe doing like letter writing campaigns to communities of color, um, helping get the word out to Binghamton University, especially with a university like Binghamton that has such a great reputation. Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly a lot that can be done. Could you tell me about other initiatives? Because you do a whole bunch of stuff. I know sure. uh, I worked with you on you know, Chinese toys, making sure that there's no uh, poison in them. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you talk about that? Um, so every single December, we um, have this report um, called Toxics in Toyland. And what we do for it is that we, with scientists and with uh, consumer advocates throughout the state um, and the country, this is actually a countrywide thing, um, different PERGs throughout the entire country um, work on this. Uh, by the way, PERG stands for Public Interest Research Group, for those of you out there wondering. Um, and we always hold big press conferences of it. Mm -hmm. We get all these different toys together and show parents out there, you know, while the colorful, um, noisy toy that your kid might be going crazy for might really want Maybe it contains lead, maybe it contains some other sort of heavy metal, um, phthalates, um, or some other chemical. Maybe it's just something as simple as a choking hazard. Mm. Um, you know, getting the message out to parents as to what they should be looking for in these toys, what they should be worried about, and giving them a little bit more peace of mind mm -hmm. about, um, about the toys that they're buying their children. Mm -hmm. you know, they can be all colorful mm -hmm. and they could definitely be inviting, but let's be honest, so is the poison dart frog. Mm. So, mm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yes, we, we do that every single winter mm -hmm. and uh, I've worked on that myself. I love that project. Yeah, that's very important. And it sort of, you know, correlates with, with the environment. We're making sure stuff is not, you know, toxic, that, you know, the stuff we put in our bodies um, is good for us. And you also do a lot of projects in the environmental field. Um, what sort of activities have you done or projects you've done in terms of environment? Well, currently we are working on a campaign regarding fracking waste. Um, when I first got involved with Diaperg, we, uh, we were working very heavily on fracking in general and banning fracking in New York State. Um, for anyone who's wondering, fracking is a form of natural gas drilling, which involves millions of gallons of fresh water, it has to be fresh, and um, mixing it with a cocktail of chemicals that they won't tell you what it is because by law um, they do not have to and so they won't. Um, and they all, then they put all this into the ground, fresh water mixed with tons of chemicals, some sand, um, and they essentially fracture the rock and that's where the fracking comes into play. That's where that word comes from. They fracture the rock and they collect the natural gas mm -hmm. and bring it back up. Now, the natural gas is methane. So anything that's released at the well site, of course, that has a huge impact mm -hmm. on, uh, on greenhouse gases because methane's five times more potent than carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. And um, so then you have to do something with the wastewater. Mm -hmm. And so you got millions of this once fresh water that contains tons of chemicals um, is possibly radioactive depending on where they frack. Uh, for example, the Marcellic Gel, which we actually stand on um, mm -hmm. and is a part of uh, the shell formation in Pennsylvania where they're fracking. And I believe it's the same one in Ohio too, but I'm not quite certain. Um, it's naturally radioactive. It's got, mm -hmm. uh, it's got radon down in, the, uh, down in the shell rock. So not only is it chemical laden, now it's also radioactive. Mm. So we were able to ban um, fracking in New York State by putting huge amounts of pressure on the governor. We broke records wow. as far as how many people were getting involved with it. It was an environmental movement unseen in this country mm -hmm. that was felt all over the world, and now there are fracking movements all throughout the world. Um, where we're moving forward on right now is, so we banned it because um, it was a public health issue. Um, there's all sorts of things that are wrong with it. I won't go into too much more detail, but so now after we've banned it, Pennsylvania is still doing it, Ohio is still doing it, and we're accepting the waste from fracking into New York State. Mm. Um, and it's either being put into dumps, like the Shimong dump not too far away, which is much more radioactive right now than it should be. Um, 
because of yeah. the fracking waste. Mm -hmm. um, they also might be putting it into water treatment systems, mm. which of course cannot handle the different chemicals that may or may not be in it, mm -hmm. but it also can't clean radioactivity. Mm -hmm. That's something that goes away on its own, so what happens after that? But the final third and scary thing is that there's no law statewide. There are counties, cities, towns, localities of all kinds that have um, that have banned fracking waste. But there are some communities around the state that may or may not be putting it right onto their roads mm. um, to use the de-icer or to keep dust down. Mm. And to think that we banned this process largely because of that waste that we're now accepting into the state right now blows our mind. So mm. we're working on a big media campaign mm -hmm. against um, fracking waste right now, especially in Binghamton. And we're also going to be um, generating public comments to the governor, mm -hmm. who actually just proposed some uh, some changes to regulations that would potentially stop it from at least being used on roads. Mm -hmm. We're still trying to figure out what exactly the language would be. But we're saying, whatever step you're taking, you need to go the full mile. Mm -hmm. You need to ban fracking waste. We already banned fracking. There's no reason mm -hmm. that fracking should have any role mm -hmm. in the state of New York. Going back to our education, you know, one person may argue that, you know, like, hey, you know, because of fracking, gas is cheaper, or maybe like, you know, Ohio that struck oil, maybe we should, you know, use fracking to get more revenue put in education. Um, but of course, there, there are long-term benefits that I think that you're correct in saying that it's not worth it. And, um, and, yeah, and I agree that, you know, fracking has its risks, of mm -hmm. course. Um, so in, in that sense, you know, what do you say to those people who say, well, you know, wouldn't that mean more money? Um, what are the bigger environmental implications that, you know, that are stronger than any economic gains at all? Well, um, for one, and I, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is the amount of fresh water it uses for each well, and there are multiple wells per pad, um, they use millions of gallons of fresh water. Now, I'm sure every single person out there knows that fresh water is one of those things that we need to survive. Um, and a lot of places throughout the world don't have enough of it. Even some places in our own country do not have enough access to clean water. Some cities, as we found out, don't have any access to clean water whatsoever mm. outside of water bottles being delivered to their city. Uh -huh, yeah. um, What's that town? Uh, it was uh, it's, uh, the city of Flint in yeah, Michigan. Yeah, Flint, yes. Michigan. Yes. Um, and it's it's a problem throughout other areas in the country too, um, and especially outside of the country, there are all sorts of areas. So first of all, I would say that wasting that much fresh water is an absolute tragedy, not just for the people in our country who need it, but for the people of the world who need it now. And it's only going to get more desperate in the future, mm. especially if we keep wasting it like that. Um, but of course, there's also issues of concern with water conta uh, groundwater contamination, mm -hmm. because of course you have these giant drills going down about a mile into the earth, and pumping into it at high pressures this once fresh water, as I mentioned, mixed with all these chemicals, um, and possibly having the well break while it's down there. And there are documented cases throughout the country um, in places like Pennsylvania, just south of the border here in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, mm. they uh, just won a lawsuit against Cabot Gas and Oil. Um, very long time in the making. For four and a half million dollars, this family won because their water had been contaminated. Wow. Um, but there are also places like um, in Texas and Oklahoma and all across the country mm -hmm. that have experienced the same sort of things. But then also, the areas around the fracking wells, um, the air quality greatly deteriorates. All sorts of truck traffic going back and forward. It takes hundreds of trucks to build these things, takes even more to continue to drive back and forth the water and then of course the gas as well that they create. Mm. Um, so it destroys the roadways mm -hmm. um, because it can only handle so much big truck traffic. Um, and it destroys the air quality with all those diesel trucks moving, with the methane that comes off from the fracking pad themselves next to people's houses, wow. some cases next to schools. Mm. Um, and then there's also been worries recently about these earthquake swarms 
mm. that we have been seeing across the country, um, particularly in the Midwest, but even as close as Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and the scientists are a little bit unclear as if it's caused by fracking itself. Most are leaning towards um, it being caused by wastewater injection wells. Mm. And so as I mentioned, what are some places doing with the wastewater that fracking creates? Well, they put it right back into the ground, into these wastewater mm. injection wells, um, and just, they believe that's what's causing the swarms of earthquakes. Wow. So there's a lot of uh, problems mm -hmm. that can arise from fracking. Um, and I think one of the big things to keep in mind is that the fracking that we're talking about, uh, horizontal hydraulic fracturing, um, it was really wasn't created until the 1990s. Often proponents will say, mm -hmm. oh, we've been fracking for decades, almost a century. Mm -hmm. Well, they're kind of right. It was a different, it was entirely different though. Mm -hmm. um, the way that we know it is completely new and it was created back in the 90s. And we just kind of went gung-ho with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the w it's the one that actually is able to turn and yes. actually enter in people's properties. Uh, mm -hmm. So moving forward, what are some ways that people can be aware of their community? Um, what are some ways that they can get engaged? Well, um, for especially you uh, Binghamton University students out there, come check out the NYPIRG office. Um, we can talk your ear off about ways that you can get involved, but we also want to hear about the way that you want to get involved, so come up to our office, it's room 318 UUW, um, University Union West, right above the marketplace, across from Black Student Union, and we will help you figure out a way that you can best get involved. Um, but you know, I, I think one of the most important things that students can do um, outside of what they're already learning in their classes is get off of Facebook for a little bit. I spend a lot of time on there too, don't worry, I, I do. <laughs> um, get off of Facebook for a little bit, learn about what's happening in your local politics, in your state politics, in national politics. Learn about the people in power, learn about the people who are supposed to be representing you and decide if you think that they should be representing you. Register to vote, use that vote, use your power as a citizen of this country to make sure that the people who should be in power and representing you, because don't forget, you don't work for them, they work for you. Hmm. Making sure that they are the people that should be in power and we all have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. But of course it does take some education. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, read, Read the newspaper more. Re look up uh, news articles online if you have to. Be a little bit more careful about the ones online, especially. Um, there is all sorts of avenues for students to get involved, for students to take action. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, Alex, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. All right, and uh, we'll see you next time.